I'm speaking today with David Peller, who's the editor of The Good Source and also the convener of the Australian Church and State Summit, who plays a significant role in opinion making in Australia. And I would just like to ask you your opinion of something extraordinary which has happened recently across the world, and that is Oprah Winfrey's uh, television interview of Meghan and Prince Harry, which one of the newspapers in Sydney, I thought rather brilliantly, has referred to as Soap Oprah. What Mm. do you think of that? I I think Meghan has some legitimate complaints, uh, but she should have kept them to herself. Uh, so I, I do sympathise that the palace bureaucracy, the firm, uh, is is something that would be extremely difficult to live with and, and perhaps none of us would want that or, or, or think it was a bed of roses if we were given it. So I, I don't think it's an absolute um, paradise of luxury and, and comfort and privilege um, that we perhaps are, are glib about um, dismissing her complaints with. What I do think, though, is that it comes with its responsibilities uh, and those things were entirely predictable. And and the two things which Meghan Markle needs to be able to do her job properly as the wife of Prince Harry uh, was a good husband who loves her, prioritises her, cares for her and is committed to her, which Princess Diana did not have, Uh, But Meghan Markle, it it appears, does have that. Uh, The second thing she needs, which Princess Diana may not also have had, was a proper real-world expectations of the responsibilities that she was taking on with her marriage. She was not just making a commitment to a man for the rest of her life, but she was making a commitment to the Commonwealth, uh, to her nation, and to the Queen, to the monarchy, the institution itself. And she was sacrificing her life to serve that institution, that her own goals, her own vanity, and as she likes to so um, pathetically complain, her voice was now completely irrelevant. Uh, And that is not a contradiction of her equality and dignity as an individual, but rather the, the greater institution which she is called to serve. And this is why Queen Elizabeth has done so remarkably well and is so loved for so many decades, so many prime ministers and governors and governors general uh, globally, so many presidents. She has outlasted them all because even the Queen's voice is not more important than the institution itself, than the monarchy, than the stability of the Commonwealth and all of those powers, something which Meghan Markle completely failed to grasp. Uh, Now, in the interview, she admitted that she did no research beforehand, and I think that was willfully ignorant of her. Uh, And she is culpable for that failure of duty of care. You're marrying into this to do so rather glibly is on your own head. Uh, Now, it is also the palace's fault that they didn't make sure she had realistic expectations. I'm incredibly surprised that Harry, in her his love and commitment to her, didn't go to the effort of, of, of pre-warning her about all the unfavourable press, about all the, the pressure, the, the toxic nature of the British media and about the unremitting demands of serving the Crown for the rest of her life. I am deeply shocked that Harry and the palace didn't make sure that she was properly prepared for this. But that is the reality, is that she should have done this. And Kate has got a realistic expectation of what's going on, does have a husband who is um, standing by her and committed to her. And she is handling exactly the same environment without any of the problems and struggles that Meghan Markle is. So I think Kate in herself is the ultimate refutation of the woe is me narrative that we're now hearing from Meghan Markle. I think you're right there, and I think you're right about Harry. He should have prepared her better. What surprised me, for example, during the conversation, during the interview, the suggestion was put out 
that young Archie may not have become a prince, probably did not become a prince because of his color, the color of his skin, which looks very white to me. The fact is, and Harry should have known this, he should have stopped her from saying anything about it in advance, because I suspect that this was rehearsed. The, uh, the reactions of, uh, of Oprah were confected. The surprise was confected. All of this was obviously research, uh, rehearsed. But what I do think Harry should have told her was that it wasn't the color of the boy's skin, his racial background, it was George V in 1917 who decided to limit the number of royal princes and princesses, and that it was his letters patent issued in that year, 1917, during the First World War, probably to limit the number of German-speaking English princes. It was his decision that blocked uh, young Archie, the son of Harry, becoming a prince. It was just part of the law made by the king, prerogative, the royal prerogative. Well, why let her go ahead and actually say this, spread that rumor around the world? This is ridiculous. But you're also right. I think there's a fundamental rule which applies to all of us. You don't wash your dirty linen in public. And that applies especially to members of the royal family, which are, which are associated with the institution of the crown. And they've fallen down very badly in that regard. And that also has indicated a certain treachery to the rest of the family, for example, leaving up in the air the suggestion that there was an improper statement about the color of the coming baby's skin. Now, mm. we know nothing about that. We don't know what was actually said. We don't know who was said, but the, the suggestion then remained that every member of the royal family said it. Oprah came out and said it wasn't the queen and it wasn't Prince Philip. But it still mm. is there up in the air, quite treacherous to the family. Meghan quite misrepresented the George V convention in the interview. She explained uh, that Prince George um, and, and her baby are exactly the same and there was a, a reinvention of the convention and, and an amendment because of racial concerns, um, which, you, which you, you point out is not in fact the case um, and that the George V convention was a limitation which does affect her child, but doesn't affect a direct line descendant of, of the uh, yes. crown. And that was done by Elizabeth II quite a while ago, well before, well before Meghan came onto the scene. It was done because the Queen's reign is much longer than expected, and she thought it appropriate that the direct line, also underneath the son of the Prince of Wales, also pass on the titles Prince and Princesses immediately on the birth. Now, that, that was a sensible convention. Restricting it to the direct line was also sensible. It was all done before Archie was even thought of. It was done before the marriage was even thought of. So it, it is something which Harry should have stopped her from saying. But people will go on debating this, and uh, it is so inappropriate. Fortunately, it has absolutely no effect on the situation in Australia, on the constitution of Australia, and whether Australians will ever consider changing their constitution in this regard. Well, thank you very much for your insights, David Fellow, into this interview, which has created such a fuss around the world, but which has absolutely no relevance to the constitutional system in Australia or to the decision that Australians may be again, yet again, asked to uh, make, and that is whether Australia should surrender the constitutional system, which we've known since well before Federation, because it applied in each of the states, and substitute what, what will inevitably be not just some republic, but a politician's republic, which will compound the powers of the politicians over the people of Australia. Well, the Australian people will decide. I, I think one of the great things about the constitutional monarchy is, is the power it denies uh, the Australian parliament. Uh, and an Australian head of state would have 
um, the reserve powers that we do not need to have here. Those kind of powers vested in Malcolm Turnbull or Bill Shorten would be absolutely disastrous. And, and the great stability that it offers Australia is the power it denies to uh, one, of, one of these parasitically egotistical careerist politicians. Very well put. Thank you.